Now this, of course, all this helped me per perpetuate this fraud and pass it on like a disease to my kids until they too figured it out. And because my daughters were brought up to be independent thinkers, they challenged me to admit it. And of course, being a wimp, I did. <laughs> You're right. It's been me all along. And the thing was, Christmases, and parents here will know this, never the same after that. They're never the same after that loss of faith. Out with faith goes the magic. And it's true there's nothing like the eyes of a child on Christmas morning, but there's also nothing like the look in those eyes when they work out you've been lying to them for years and the magic isn't real. St. Paul says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. My parents never yielded to entirely undermining the chance that I'd have faith in the unseen part of Christmas. Why would loving parents do that? Their insistence on Santa drove me nuts, and I think it made me lose a bit of respect for them, or rather gave me the sense that they didn't respect me enough to tell me the truth and own up to it, to confirm my disillusionment. Man, that's a prescription for surly teenhood years and a skeptical adulthood, so we don't get fooled again. Yet, fool my kids, I did. But it was in the wee Christmas morning hours after my girls, who were exhausted by anticipation, would be asleep, and I'd be often alone putting together swing sets, climbing frames, trampolines, and such, that I began to figure out what this ongoing congenital fraud actually betokened, why my parents willed it, and why I passed it on. Though I resolved, like most of us, not to become my parents, I did anyway. Like my father before me, I would get out the wrenches and the screwdrivers and bloody my knuckles on assembling things. I can still see my father's Christmas morning hands look like he'd been in a bar fight Christmas Eve. The air, as I'm putting these things together, thick with muffled curses as I, like him, struggle to translate, struggle with the translated assembly instructions. When I was a kid, I took the noises of muffled curses to be reindeer and elves going about the business. <laughs> Looking back over those years of hushed assembly in the wee hours, running out to all-night service stations to get batteries that were not included, I began to understand something about the nature of love. Immanuel Kant was one of the first thinkers to clearly distinguish between two kinds of love, pathological love and practical love. And he says, love as an affection cannot be commanded but beneficence for duty's sake may be. And even if we are not impelled to it by any inclination, nay, are even repelled by a natural and unconquerable aversion, this is practical love and not pathological, a love which is seated in the will and not in the senses, in principles of action, not of tender sympathy. And it is this love alone which can be commanded it's in this manner, he says, that we are to understand those passages of Scripture in which we are commanded to love our neighbor, even our enemy. The will my parents had to save all year, to provide us with a truckload of goods denied them in their depression childhood, and the will to spend Christmas Eve not out lapping it up with workmates, or whatever childless people do, but driving screws, tightening bolts, parsing complex translated instructions, and wrapping, beribboning, and tagging everything from Santa, thereby totally effacing their year-long efforts. And the frantic, hushed work of Christmas Eve till the wee hours, totally effacing themselves from the entire project by saying, it's all from Santa like them barking my knuckles on bolts and pulling my hair out over garbled assembly instructions at 3 a.m. in the same way, I recognize that just like me, they didn't particularly want to be putting themselves through this. They would probably have preferred a bottle of wine and an old movie and curling up on the couch. But just as I knew, they must surely have sensed 
that the money splashed out on toys and such is ultimately wasted and would have been better spent on a better house or on our education or on furniture that wasn't collapsing. Like them, I didn't particularly feel like doing it anyway. Nor did they, I suspect. But not feeling like it and doing it anyway, willing it to happen, that's what Kant means by practical love and where he says any true moral worth lies. If one were inclined to do this in the first place, where's the credit in that? Where's the sacrifice? Doing what you feel like, anybody can do that. And the feeling can just as easily go away as come. And in performing this duty of love for my kids, I realized, this is about 10 years ago, I realized that I would never be loved like that again, practically, unconditionally, willed. Had I only known it then, that their absurd insistence on Santa, on the spirit of Christmas, this knowing fraud they insisted upon, was a self-effacing way of showing to themselves, at least, that they could be, even for a time, charity itself. They say it's the thought that counts, but it's no good just thinking about giving somebody a gift. You need the deed as well as the thought, which brings me back to the unwanted orange. It turns out, I found this out later, that the gift of an orange is an Anglo-Irish tradition from whom we get much of our Christmas traditions. In the cold climates of the Northern Hemisphere, such fruit was a rarity and a positive boon for getting through the long winter without catching pneumonia and therefore dying. An orange here and there boosted your vitamin C count and therefore fortified the immune system against the want of fresh vegetables and sunlight. It was, in short, the gift of the orange, a kind of gift of life itself, expensive in the old days as gold, comforting as myrrh, and as fragrant as frankincense. Its origins as a Christmas gift are in an act of practical love. And when my parents gave me the orange, they did so without thinking about any of that. They just passed it on. It was a talisman of life itself down the unthinking generations. They're not, they didn't even know why they were doing it, but they did it because it was done to them. And so this orange giving can, exists in a kind of cultural memory, invisible, timeless, everywhere, like, well, like the spirit of Christmas itself. Invisible, timeless, and everywhere. It's the thought that counts. Maybe it even counts if you don't even know why you're thinking it. It's the act of giving itself, mindful or not, out of beneficence, out of duty, as Kant would say, an act of practical love. You don't have to feel like it. You don't even have to know why you're doing it. But we are bound to give. He says it is a duty to be beneficent when we can. We can most easily give when it's expected. 